The Epilepsy Foundation is pleased to share with you an educational webinar on neurostimulation in the treatment of drug-resistant epilepsy. The mission of the Epilepsy Foundation is to lead the fight to overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. My name is Dr. Elaine Kiriakopoulos, and I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us tonight. This Epilepsy Foundation educational webinar is brought to you with support from Neuropace. Stimulating the brain in epilepsy might seem illogical or counterintuitive. However, neurostimulation therapy may provide a good treatment option for patients with seizures that are resistant to medications or if a person is not a candidate for traditional brain surgery or for someone who continues to have seizures after surgery. To help guide learning about the role of stimulation in the treatment of drug-resistant epilepsy, we are so very fortunate to have with us our guest speaker, Dr. Lawrence Hirsch. I am honored to be able to share with you this evening an introduction to Dr. Hirsch. Dr. Hirsch completed medical school and internship at Yale University, then went on to do his neurology, neurology residency at Columbia University and a two-year fellowship in epilepsy and EEG at Columbia. He re remained at Columbia on the faculty from 1997 through 2011, where he created and directed the Continuous EEG Monitoring Program at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center for 10 years and became Professor of Clinical Neurology at Columbia University in 2010. He then moved to Yale University in 2011 as Professor of Neurology, Director of Epilepsy EEG, and Co-Director of Critical Care EEG Monitoring and of the Yale Comprehensive Epilepsy Center. Dr. Hirsch has published more than 140 original research manuscripts and more than 120 invited reviews, editorials, or chapters. His research interests and publications are on topics such as brain monitoring with EEG in the critically ill, status epilepticus, epilepsy surgery, seizure semiology, electrocorticography, brain mapping, effectiveness and tolerability of anti-epileptic drugs, brain stimulation for epilepsy, and sudden death in epilepsy. Dr. Hirsch has directed symposia and lectured at many national and international epilepsy and neurology meetings. He's the founder and former chair of the Critical Care EEG Monitoring Research Consortium, which now includes over 50 centers. He has won multiple teaching awards and is co-author of the first ever Atlas of EEG in Critical Care. Dr. Hirsch, thank you for sharing your time with us this evening. Guest speaker dis disclosures for tonight. Dr. Hirsch has received fees for speaking and running webinars for NeuroPACE, the maker of the responsive neurostimulator. We are also fortunate to have with us two webinar panelists who have firsthand experience with neurostimulation therapy. They will be sharing their personal stories around the, how they came to the decision to pursue neurostimulation therapy and the impact it has had on their lives. With us this evening, we have Ms. Marianne Widener joining us from Massachusetts and Ms. Kimberly Bari joining us from California. Thank you both for sharing your time with us. I'd like to review with you the format for tonight's webinar. During the speaker presentations, all phone lines will be muted. We would like to encourage everyone to submit their questions at any time during the webinar. To do so, type your question into the question window on the GoToWebinar panel and click Send. We will then read your questions aloud during the question and answer portion of the webinar. 
Please keep your questions general in nature as the webinar is intended for educational purposes and does not take the place of individual medical advice. This webinar will be recorded and available for viewing and listening in the future on epilepsy.com. The Epilepsy Foundation is working to provide information and education that serves the spectrum of individuals and families impacted by epilepsy. Often, when you have a question about your health or your loved one's health, you may hear or read things that you are not sure how to interpret. The Foundation's webinar series aims to bring together clinical experts and researchers in the field of epilepsy to share with you up-to-date and accurate information to help answer your questions. At this time, I would like to turn the webinar over to Dr. Hirsch, who will begin our presentation for this evening. Dr. Hirsch, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you in advance to our two panelists as well. So I will start by talking about some basics about epilepsy. Uh, and then we'll move on to drug-resistant epilepsy and the topic for today, which is neurostimulation. So epilepsy is a seizure disorder. It basically means you're predisposed to recurrent seizures. The old definition for many years was that you had to have two or more unprovoked seizures. That means nothing, there was no immediate cause to the seizures. They seemed to happen for no reason. The new definition is to either have two or more seizures or to have one seizure plus a known increased risk of further seizures. So this can be known from an abnormal EEG or abnormal brain imaging, such as with an MRI and sometimes with some other risk factors or specific epilepsy syndromes. And in general, once someone qualifies as having epilepsy, that warrants treatment, which is virtually always starts with medications. The diagnosis of epilepsy indicates that a person is at risk for recurrent seizures. It does not say anything about the cause or anything about the prognosis and whether it's going to be uh, rare seizures are easily controlled or one of the more difficult ones. There are many different types of epilepsies, but the two main categories are what are known as focal and generalized. So focal seizures will start in one place on one side of the brain, as opposed to generalized seizures, which seem to start on both sides in very broad areas all at once. So the main treatment for people with epilepsy are anti-seizure medications. They're also known as anti-epileptic drugs or anti-convulsants. And the goal of these medications is to get rid of seizures and to not cause any side effects at all. So no seizures, no side effects. That's the goal of treatment. 60 to 70% of people with epilepsy do have fully controlled seizures. So that's the good news. The bad news is about one third of people 30 to 40% have uncontrolled seizures, so the medicine does not completely get rid of them. And th there's a whole spectrum from very uncomplicated epilepsy where there are no other issues other than seizures and they're easily controlled with a single medication, all the way to more severe epilepsies with frequent seizures despite medication and with other comorbidities, side effects, and, and much more difficult aspects to take care of. So the definition of drug-resistant epilepsy is a failure of adequate trials of two appropriate medications. And, and when this happens, the official guidelines are that uh, someone should be referred to or be seen by a specialist, preferably at an epilepsy center, to make sure the diagnosis is correct, to make sure the treatments are correct, and to pick the best treatment for that patient, whether it's additional medications or some of the other things such as diets, surgeries, or neurostimulation. So the treatment options for people who have drug-resistant epilepsy, as I mentioned, are surgery, neurostimulation, including three different kinds that we'll talk about today, the ketogenic diet, which is a very high-fat diet, and there are some other variants of that as well, investigational medications, or to simply manage triggers. There are some people who only have seizures 
with certain triggers present. And obviously, if you can just avoid those, that would be the best treatment. So neurostimulation, the topic for today. So neurostimulation is the purposeful modulation of the nervous system's activity using either invasive or non-invasive means. So invasive usually means you need a surgeon involved, and non-invasive means you do not. And this refers to electromagnetic approaches. And neuro, the word modulation really means to have any lasting effect on the spontaneous activity of the brain. So some of the more invasive ones that do require surgery are uh, three of them we'll be talking about today. So the vagus nerve stimulator, or VNS, responsive neurostimulator, or RNS, or deep brain stimulation, DBS. The non-invasive ones include transcranial magnetic stimulation and transcranial current stimulation, sometimes called direct current stimulation. Neither of those are approved for epilepsy, and they're in fairly early stages of research. But the three invasive ones that we'll be talking about today are all approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. So in general, neurostimulation is what we call a palliative option, means it is not curative in the majority of patients. So there still will be some seizures present. In general, for people who have medication-resistant seizures, the ideal treatment is resective surgery, a traditional surgery where a piece of the brain that causes the seizures is actually removed. And the goal of that surgery is actual cure, to not have any seizures at all after that. However, many patients are not candidates for resective surgery or for what's now known as a laser ablation. This is another way of destroying the abnormal cells causing seizures in the brain. So rather than cutting them out, you can actually put a thin probe in and heat them using lasers to destroy the abnormal cells. Those are uh, permanent effects on certain parts of the brain. And the goal, again, is to completely get rid of seizures in those cases. Um, however, about 20% of patients who do undergo surgery or laser ablation, or a little bit more, will still have seizures after and still needs additional treatments. And neurostimulation is an option in those people. So I'm gonna go in order from VNS to RNS to DBS. So we'll start with vagus nerve stimulation. That is the oldest of the stimulators. So this was first approved by the US FDA in 1997, both for epilepsy and for depression. It's the most common neurostimulation method with more than 100,000 people having this, including many children. It's also the only one of the three we'll talk about today that does not involve brain surgery at all. So what are the indications or what are the official uh, features of a patient that would make one qualified to have this? So one is it's approved for add-on therapy. So it doesn't replace medication. It's used in addition to medication. When it's successful, you can offer low, often lower the other medications, but it's unusual to be able to completely come off. It's approved for patients who are four years of age and older. It's used for focal onset seizures. Another word for that is partial onset that are resistant to anti-seizure medications, but it also works for virtually all types of seizures. Um, it's really only offered when curative surgery is not an option. Again, if you can do the more definitive curative procedure, that's, that should be offered first. And again, when seizures persist after surgery, the vagus nerve stimulator is a good option. So the goals are to prevent seizures or to shorten them, to make them less intense, or to speed up recovery from the seizure. It has, as I mentioned, been used for all types of epilepsy and specifically studied in the focal ones, the generalized ones, and a specific syndrome known as Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So it's really virtually all types. So this is what it looks like. The, the battery and the computer are placed in the chest wall. And then there are wires that go to a nerve in the neck called the vagus nerve. And the leads are attached to that nerve. 
Then there are mild pulses of electrical stimulation are given to the vagus nerve. It's programmed to do this in a very regular fashion. Most typical one is 30 seconds of stimulation and then five minutes off, and then another 30 seconds on, and it does that day and night. The new models have uh, some additional features. One is they can respond when the heart rate suddenly increases. That's often a sign that a seizure is occurring, uh, and it will give additional stimulation when that occurs. So that is a responsive component for the vagus nerve stimulation in addition to the programmed ongoing scheduled stimulation. In addition, patients get a uh, handheld magnet that they can use to swipe over the device, which will give yet another stimulation. So if they have a, an aura or a warning of a seizure, or if somebody around them sees a seizure starting, they can swipe the magnet and give an additional stimulation. As far as side effects and risks, the most common side effect by far is hoarseness. So some change in the quality of the voice. Uh, and that's usually related to how strong the stimulation is. So if it's too severe, it can be adjusted to decrease that. Um, other ones are sore throat, coughing, shortness of breath, usually when it's very early in the treatment or when it's turned up too quickly. And those can be modified if it's a problem. Um, the, the main risk of doing it are infection. So you certainly can with anything, whenever anything is implanted in the body, there's a risk of infection. There's also some risk of bleeding, of injury to the vagus nerve, or the parts of the device can malfunction. There have been some advances in the vagus nerve stimulator technology. The, the oldest one uh, would just give the continuous stimulation without the responsive component at all that I mentioned. But the newer ones have this heart rate trigger that uh, adds an additional feature. And you can still use the magnet to provide extra stimulation with that as well. Then there's a very new model that just came out. Um, which allows you to adjust stimulation at different times of the day or night and also allows programming changes to be done remotely without having to go to the doctor's office. With the prior models, it could only be done in the doctor's office. So this way you could be programmed to slowly go up over many weeks and have that happen automatically at home without coming back to the office. So how effective is it? So the, how well it controls seizures is known as efficacy. So in the original blinded trials, that means the stimulation was compared to some kind of control. In this case, it was a very low level of stimulation. So uh, with the full stimulation, there was a 24.5% decrease in seizures compared to 6% in the low stimulation group. Another number we use in all kinds of trials with seizures is what's called the responder rate. So that's the percent of patients that have at least a 50% reduction in their seizures. In the high stimulation group, that was 31%. And in the very low stimulation control group, it was 13%. And the average decrease in seizures was 28% for the high stimulation versus 15% in the low stimulation. So what about long-term outcome? So this is done without a control group or a comparison group. It was just a look back at over 400 patients who had vagus nerve stimulator implanted. They found an average seizure reduction of 56%. And then here's some additional numbers. So there was a greater than 90% decrease in seizures in 22.5% of patients. And 7.5% uh, were actually completely seizure free for the final six months in this study. There were no major predictors of who was going to respond to this and who wasn't. As far as adverse effects, there was some permanent injury to the vagus nerve in 2.8% of patients, and usually that just causes some change in the voice, some mild hoarseness. All right, now I'm going to move on to the responsive neurostimulator, or RNS. So this is a, a little different in that it's a device that is implanted in the skull. Okay, so this is what the device looks like. It actually replaces a small piece of the skull. And then you can put two different electrodes, attach it to this device, and that goes either into the brain surface or on the, I'm sorry, into the brain itself or on the surface of the brain. 
and it is placed at the location where seizures arise. So it's known as the seizure focus, or if it's more than one, it's seizure foci. So in this one, you have to know where the seizures come from. And this is what's known as a responsive device. I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but that means it reads the brain waves, known as EEG activity, and it waits until it sees a seizure trying to start. And then it will responsively stimulate, give a little shock to prevent the seizure from spreading. And all that, when it's working, all that happens without the patient feeling anything or having any idea anything's going on in their head. So this is the first and only device that is currently available that monitors and responds to brain activity. It was approved for use in 2013 and also as add-on therapy to medications. It's only approved for adults at this point. Uh, in people who are diagnosed with drug-resistant epilepsy, in those who have focal onset seizures that begin in one or two areas of the brain. The most common reason to do it are people who have what's known as bitemporal epilepsy. That means seizures come from both of the temporal lobes. And also, if seizures come from a seizure focus that is in an area of the brain that cannot be removed or ablated with a laser. So in other words, if it's in an area that's too important, so either it's related to language or movement, vision, uh, any one of those would be an area that we cannot remove without causing a problem, then they'd be a good candidate for responsive neurostimulation. The neurostimulator is placed in the bone, as I mentioned, in the skull itself. It's a, and then you put the leads into the area where seizures come from. Once the device is placed, there is really no evidence looking at that patient that they had surgery. So there's no, there are no scars. Um, because it's under the hairline. So cosmetically, it's very attractive to patients. Uh, and then very small pulse of stimulation are given when these abnormal brainwave patterns are seen. People cannot feel the stimulation in general. If they do, you can adjust it so they do not. Um, and the stimulation itself does not cause any permanent effects. And the device can also be removed if it's not helping the person. This is uh, what it looks like in a close-up. Um, and here is the laptop that the patient takes home themselves. They hold a little wand up. It looks just like a computer mouse up to the device in their skull or right near it. And they can download the activity. It goes to the laptop. Then they plug the laptop into the internet. The recordings get uploaded. And the uh, doctors can review them remotely uh, through the internet and through the web. Here's just another diagram of the device itself and an x-ray of somebody after having the device implanted. Um, so here's an example of the kind of recordings we get from it. And what this shows is seizure activity starting where it says seizure onset. And then when it turns blue, that's when the computer said, aha, I detect abnormal activity that might be a seizure starting. Then the device gives a treatment, that's the TR, followed by uh, a stimulation that's usually just a fraction of a second. And in this case, it was successful and that seizure activity goes away. So how effective is this? So the pivotal study that led to approval of this device included 191 people. And they were divided into two groups. Everyone got the device implanted, but for the first five months or so, one group received stimulation and the other received sham stimulation where actually the device was off and that was the control group. Uh, this is a little bit about the patients who were in the study. They had epilepsy for an average of 20 years. A third of them already tried the vagus nerve stimulator. A third already had epilepsy surgery. They averaged 10 seizures per month. And these were the results. So in this blinded phase where half the patients got stimulated and half did not, there was a 38% reduction in seizure frequency in the group that got stimulated and a 17% reduction in the group that did not get stimulated. And in the final month of this blinded phase with the sham group, 
the stimulation group had a 42% reduction in seizures compared to before the stimulation. And the group that had the sham stimulation had only a 9% decrease. So basically gone back very close to where they had been before the device. And this is what that looked like graphically. So uh, this shows how many seizures per month they were having here on the y-axis. And this shows the uh, five-month period. And this is what's known as the blinded evaluation period, where people in these, the dark squares were getting stimulation and people in the white diamonds were not. And as you can see, the ones in the white diamond gradually went back up to where they started, whereas those who had the stimulation on continued to improve some. And you can also see that in both groups, right after getting the device implanted, they had a significant improvement. So that's at the one month mark, and that's known as the implant effect. And that's, that's seen with deep brain stimulation and responsive nerve stimulation, where just implanting the device seems to have some benefit. But if you don't turn stimulation on, that's a transient one that goes away over a few months. So what about long-term outcomes? So this was a study that looked at five-year outcome and found that there was a 60% responder rate. I mean, 60% of patients had their seizures cut in half or better. And what about seizure freedom? So how many people were seizure free? So it turned out 36.7%, just over one out of three, had at least a three-month period without any seizures at some time during the trial. 23% had at least one six-month period without any seizures. And 12.9% had at least one year of seizure freedom. Remember, these people were averaging 10 seizures per month before. And this is a summary of the results looking at different areas of the brain where the seizures come from and how those people did. And you can see no matter where they came from, there's somewhere around a 60 or 70% decrease in seizures. And the only exception was people who had seizures coming from multiple areas of the brain. Uh, and they had a little bit of a lower rate if it came from multiple lobes, but it was still uh, a significant benefit in half the people. And looking at seizure-free periods based on where in the brain the seizures came from, uh, they were, it was very similar regardless of where they came from. And about 15% of people went a whole year without any seizures and 29% went six months without any seizures. As far as adverse events, similar to any device, there are some infections. So about, um, if you look at five years, which included battery changes, overall about 9% of patients had some type of infection at some point. There were no infections that actually involved the brain itself, only outside the brain, most commonly the scalp or the skull. Uh, as far as bleeding in the head or the brain, there were a few, but none of them caused any permanent neurologic deficits or things like having trouble moving or talking or anything like that. And there was only one person who had chronic headaches. Um, status epilepticus, which is a term for prolonged seizures, uh, occurred in 3.5% of subjects. Again, these are people with very severe epilepsy, so that's actually a, it's a fairly low number. Um, and they could occur at any point in the study. Then there's, as far as sudden unexpected death in epilepsy or SUDEP, this is known to occur in, in about one in a thousand patients with epilepsy overall. And in people who are surgical candidates, it's somewhere between six and nine out of 1,000 patients every year. That's the comparator number. And the rate of SUDEP in the RNS trials was two out of 1,000, which was uh, lower than the expected rate. And the improvement is probably just by improving seizures, since we know the biggest risk factor for the sudden death and epilepsy are uncontrolled convulsive seizures. There have been some neuropsychological outcomes. So this is formal cognitive testing and with responsive neurostimulator, and there's been no decline in any measure. There's been improvement in naming and verbal learning and significant improvements in quality of life. And the majority of people choose to replace the RNS battery, even though it does require surgery. It's not brain surgery, but it is scalp and skull surgery. So 
So there are some other advantage of the responsive neurostimulator in, in that it gives you very valuable information from recordings of the brain activity. So if people who have the bitemporal seizures, seizures coming from both sides, it can really help figure out which side is more active and is causing more of the seizures. In addition, it's been very useful for seeing when pe people have had seizures and counting them. So a lot of patients are not aware of all their seizures. They're only aware of some of them. And some patients are not aware of any of their seizures. And this gives a real objective count of how many seizures people are having. Uh, there have been several patients who've gone on to have resective or curative surgery based on the recordings from their RNS device. So, for example, someone who was thought to have seizures from both temporal lobes, but went back on medications and in their usual environment, they turned out they only had seizures from one side, and then that was able to re be removed surgically. Uh, we've also learned a lot of things about different patterns of what time seizures occur. Uh, it turns out almost everybody has some kind of circadian pattern. That means certain times of the day, they're more likely to have seizures. There's also um, catamenial patterns. That means this relates to menstrual cycles. And then there's, turns very interestingly, it turns out almost everyone has these cycles that are somewhere around three weeks long. And this is men and women. Uh, the, and some of them are very strong cycles where every three weeks or so, they're much more likely to have seizures. And this can be very useful for adjusting medications or predicting seizures. Um, there's some evidence that it can tell you whether a drug is gonna work or not very early based on the recordings and how much abnormal activity is seen in the brain after a new drug is tried. Um, but that's still in early stages of research. And in some patients, you can use the device as a seizure warning. As it sees lots of abnormal activity, you can set it to stimulate the patient in a sense that they can actually feel it and give them a warning that they're more likely to have seizures. That's also still in the research phases and the device is not approved for any of those uh, last uses, those last few bullets that I just discussed. So what about deep brain stimulation? This is the most recently approved one. In fact, it was uh, just approved a couple months ago in the United States. So it's been available as a treatment for Parkinson's disease for a couple of decades. However, that's in a slightly different place in the brain. Uh, so there's a lot of experience with placing these and we know a lot about the safety and the surgical techniques. Uh, but it's uh, only recently, as I mentioned, approved for epilepsy in a slightly different target in the brain. It's actually put in what's known as the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. So it's approved for add-on therapy for reducing seizures in adults only with focal seizures that have been refractory, I mean, they have not responded to three or more medications. And it's only been proven to be safe and effective in those who average six or more seizures per month, because that's, that's who was studied in the trials. So uh, a surgeon places the device, it's two probes that go deep into the thalamus, one on each side, I'll show you some pictures in a minute. And then it's programmed to stimulate, really very similar to the vagus nerve, where it stimulates for, a little, for 30 seconds or so and then is off for several minutes. And this does not, is not a responsive device, and then it does not read the uh, brain waves. It's just scheduled to stimulate. And as I mentioned, it's already been used to treat many other conditions, mostly Parkinson's, but also some other conditions. Um, so this is what it looks like. The device itself is put in the chest wall, similar to the vagus nerve stimulator. And the uh, wires go under the skin up, up to the brain where these two probes are placed. And they're placed into deep in the brain into the thalamus. There are multiple other areas of the brain that have been stimulated to treat seizures, but they're not approved for epilepsy yet. And there's still a lot more investigation going on on exactly what the best place is for which patients. But this device right now is only approved for use in the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and only for focal seizures. Uh, but having said that, it seems to work for focal onset seizures from anywhere in the brain. So uh, this was the original study, it was called SANTE, which stands for Stimulation of the Anterior Nucleus of the Thalamus in Epilepsy. There were 110 patients in 17 centers. 
Now this is what it looks like on an MRI. So these are the actual probes with a few contacts uh, into the thalamus. And this is what it looks like in another view where these two little dark circles in the middle are in the thalamus. And these were the results. You see it looks very similar to the RNS results I showed. So there's the implantation effect where seizures get better with surgery. Then there was continued improvement in the group that was randomized to having the stimulation on. And then the group that was randomized to having stimulation off went back towards baseline. They still were slightly better. Um, and then after this period was over in both of the studies, everybody got turned on. So the only you were only randomized to off for a few months and then you were able to turn the device on. So these are the long-term results. So seizure improvement continued to improve and that's been true with all three stimulators that over time, they seem to do better and better. So the results in those first three or four months in the blinded trials were, they were significant, but not, not dramatically beneficial. But over several years, they seem to get better with all these devices. So it was up to 69% seizure reduction at five years, or looking at the responder rate, it was 68% at five years. And as far as seizure freedom, they reported that at five years, 16% had been seizure free for the last three months. And they did study the seizure severity and quality of life, and those improved compared to baseline, both at one year and at five years. As far as adverse effects, uh, there were no significant symptoms from bleeding. Uh, there were some infections in 13% overall, but again, none involving the brain itself. Most were in the chest wall where the device and the battery are. Um, there were some episodes of status epilepticus. Uh, the one thing that was noticed in the early trial was that patients tended to report depression or memory trouble more often if they were being stimulated than they were not. However, on formal testing of their memory and on longer term studies of quality of life, including mood scales, there was no worsening. And as far as the sudden death in epilepsy, it was 2.9 per thousand patient years, also lower than the expected rate. So in summary, vagus nerve stimulator, the advantages are there's a very long experience with this. It's the least invasive with no brain surgery needed. You don't need to pinpoint exactly where the seizures come from. It seems to work for all epilepsy types. You get a magnet that allows you to activate it and get extra stimulation when you need it. There's now a heart rate trigger. There's some evidence that it, it helps mood, that's depression, and there's increased benefit over time. That last point true of all three of these. The cons are it's only modestly effective, so it's very unlikely to lead to long-term seizure freedom. You cannot get a neck or chest MRI scan if you have this. And cosmetically, there are two scars, one in the neck and one in the chest wall. Um, and it does not provide any EEG recordings, it just stimulates. The responsive neurostimulator, the advantage is it provides you these EEG recordings and diagnostic information. These, this is the only one that is responsive stimulation all the time, and that has not been proven to be better than scheduled stimulation yet, but uh, it, theoretically it's better and it's kind of an attractive idea that you only get stimulation when you need it. There's improvement over time, and cosmetically, there are no visible scars once the hair goes back over the area of surgery. The cons are that you need to know exactly where the seizures come from. You can only treat one or two foci. The efficacy is also modest. It says that for all three of them, in that long-term seizure freedom is not that likely, although it was 14 or 15 percent. That's for being seizure-free for one year. Um, and you, right now, you cannot get a brain MRI if you have one of these in. In deep brain stimulation, you don't need to localize. There's improvement over time. And again, the cons, as it says with all of them, is the modest efficacy. It's hard to get uh, brain MRIs. Um, it does not provide EEG recording. And there's some evidence that it worsens reports of depression, at least in the short term. So the ideal patient for deep brain stimulation is a multifocal 
not well localized, but no history of depression. So that's kind of a, a rapid tour of the three types of neurostimulators that we have available now. And with that, I will turn it back over to Elaine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch, um, for that wonderful um, comprehensive review of VNS, RNS, um, and DBS treatment options. At this time, um, I would like to share with all of you uh, Ms. Marianne Widener, who is a nurse, a wife, a mom, and a new grandmother. Um, I hope it's okay to share that, Marianne. I know it's a, a, wonderful, jo a wonderful joy in your life. Um, and she will share with us her epilepsy journey leading to VNS therapy and the impact VNS has had in her life. Marianne, thank you for being here this evening um, and sharing your experience with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Ann, and I am currently 56 years old and was diagnosed with epilepsy at age 31. At the time, I had been through nursing school, was married, had three, two children. I had my first seizure, a generalized tonic-clonic seizure in front of my five-year-old daughter. After the first seizure happened, I sought the care of a neurologist who diagnosed me with epilepsy and began medical treatment to control my seizures. My seizures were very well controlled with medication for the first five years. I had gotten a dream job as a visiting nurse and on the evening of January 2nd, 1998, came home after seeing a patient and had another generalized tonic-clonic seizure in front of my family. I was sent by ambulance to the local ER. At the time, I remember thinking, things will go back to normal after my neurologist made a, a medication adjustment, but unfortunately, things became a nightmare. I went from being a mother, wife, and caregiver to suddenly feeling out of control as I was experiencing frequent breakthrough seizures. After this second seizure, I had to go undergo several trials of medication and multiple tests to try to sort out why I was not regaining control of my seizures. I was, I was having a tough time with seizures causing me to have difficulty speaking and remembering I felt like I was losing entire days. During the worst times, my husband even had to help with feeding me. I remember that it was my father that saw a story about vagal nerve stimulation in the newspaper, and he shared it with me. I discussed this possibility with my doctor and nurse, and they made the decision to pursue VNS as a treatment option. My first surgery to implant the VNS was done in March 2001. Physically, going through the operation, I recall the incision in my neck and the incision over the device in my chest being sore, but only for a few days. When the VNS was first turned on, I felt some strain in my voice at first, but it improved really quickly, and I and my family, we've gotten used to it. Since it was first implanted, I have had to have the VNS device battery replaced two times, once in 2010 and the other in 2016. Now, I always have a magnet on my wrist to, so that my VNS treatment is accessible. We also keep magnets around the house and everyone knows how to use them. My son was nine years old when this was put in and he even knew how to use it. I also want to share that I was at first also concerned about being able to have mammograms with the device implanted in my chest, but it has not affected the ability to have that medical testing done. After having the VNS device implanted, I had hoped to be off medication and be able to go back to work. Instead, my medication continues to help me control my seizures, and I have the VNS magnet to use as a treatment when I feel a seizure is coming. I continue to take two seizure medications and go to see the neurologist and the nurse who adjust the device every six months. 
My seizures are well controlled with this combination of treatment. My last seizure was in February of this year, but that was in the setting of the flu, having the flu with a high temperature. The VNS device has made a difference in my seizure control and my quality of life. I am fortunate in that I have an aura be before my seizures, which gives me time to get myself positioned safely on the floor and swipe my magnet over the VNS device to help stop a seizure from happening. Before my VNS was implanted, when I was having frequent seizures, I did not feel confident to take a walk outside or be on my own. I now feel confident and can do things like walk my dog in the neighborhood or shop alone in a mall or a grocery store. I am even able to help care for my grandson, which is one of my greatest joys. The VNS made a difference for me and my family. I have had some breakthrough seizures in the VNS in the 17 years since it was implanted but it significantly reduced the frequency of my seizures and has given me a way to be able to respond to my auras when they happen. It may not have given me the perfect life that I had dreamed of, but it has given me the quality of life and happiness that I had always hoped for. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, um, for sharing your experience with VNS therapy. Your personal account demonstrates uh, for everyone how for some patients, uh, neurostimulation can provide reassurance and help to improve their day-to-day -day quality of life. We really appreciate you being here this evening. I just really hope it helps someone else. Thank you so much. Next, we will hear from Ms. Kimberly Bari. I would like to share that Ms. Bari is our colleague and a member of the team at the Epilepsy Foundation of Northern California. Ms. Bari also serves as a volunteer ambassador for Neuropace, sharing her RNS story and providing support for patients and family. Kimberly, can I turn it over to you now? Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. I've been living with epilepsy for eight years. I began having focal aware and focal impaired seizures while I was living abroad, returned to the States and was diagnosed in 2011. Since then, I've, uh, I've had two brain resection surgeries along with an RNS system implant with my temporal lobe. Although my doctor agreed on the resection of three areas of my brain, there was concern that resecting the fourth area could affect my cognition and linguistic ability. That said, my epileptologist suggested implanting the RNS system, and after my family helped me understand the basics, I was ready to, to move forward. In May 2017, I was awake for the second resection surgery and then put to sleep for the RNS system implant. It's taken time for me to heal from the resection, but I can't say that I've had any issues with the RNS system itself. I don't feel it. I haven't experienced any pain from it, and I'm happy to say that I now consider my doctor's appointments to be more like learning sessions. My follow-up appointments are about every three months, and this is when adjustments are made. My epileptologist shares and discusses the data with me. He explains the possible adjustments, and as a patient, it's up to me to decide what I feel most, most comfortable with. I now consider myself a part of the seizure control team. I'm so grateful that I'm no longer dealing with epilepsy alone, and this has given me immense positivity. Although I still experience focal aware seizures, they continue to become less frequent and less severe. When a seizure begins, I do my best to swipe the magnet across my scalp and time the episode. After it ends, I sign into myseizury.com and log what I felt. I appreciate that my doctors can view this as well. Overall, I'm regaining self-confidence as I know that there are many additional adjustment options to try over time. Finally, as a program coordinator at the Epilepsy Foundation of Northern California, it's truly my goal to provide awareness and support within the community. So many thanks for having me this evening and I'm wishing the best to you all. 
Thank you, Kimberly, for sharing your experience with responsive neurostimulation, your willingness to help others understand RNS therapy by relating the impact it has made in your life is so very appreciated. We hope tonight's webinar provided you with a better understanding of neurostimulation and the treatment of drug-resistant epilepsy. If you or someone you know is living with seizures that are not well controlled, we want to encourage you to find support in those closest to you and begin your journey to finding the best possible care for your epilepsy. Taking the time to explore all available treatment options with your epilepsy care team will bring you the best chance for achieving seizure control, lessening the risks seizures can bring, and improving your health and quality of life. To learn more about the evaluation of drug-resistant epilepsy, speak with your physician or nurse. Visit www.epilepsy.com or call the Epilepsy Foundation 24-7 helpline. You can also reach out to your local Epilepsy Foundation who can help to provide information about where the Epilepsy Center nearest you is. There you'll be able to link with physicians and nurse specialists uh, and neurosurgeons who can help to provide you more information around neurostimulation therapy. At this time, I would like to again thank Dr. Hirsch for sharing his time and his expertise with us this evening, and thank Ms. Marianne Weiner and Ms. Kimberly Barry for sharing their personal journeys with us. I would also like to thank all of you who have joined us for an evening of learning.